So a lot of the stuff we've touched on throughout the uh, sessions, but documentation, you know, in, in, in bits and pieces, I've told you how documentation is often a nagging problem in the cases. It's not a fatal problem. We don't get creamed on documentation problems, not usually, but it's a nagging problem to the defensibility of a case, making a strong case a good case, making a good case an okay case, and making a, a troublesome case even worse. And I'm going to give, I'm gonna give you a lot of tips. You know, we've talked a lot about things you should do. I'm going to give you some practical tips. Write this, um, that, that sort of thing in this lecture. And then in the, in the whole uh, uh, session, the whole course, with a couple of my favorite case studies. So we talked about differential diagnosis. We've been through this on and on and on. And we talked about um, how best to use it or not use it. And if you're going to put things in the differential diagnosis, of course, you've got to address those things. But there's some good uh, uh, catch-all language like I talked about. So this will be in your materials, and this is good stuff to write. This comes straight from me and Ross and John putting our heads together on what is the best thing to write at the end of a differential diagnosis. Or for that matter, maybe you didn't use the differential diagnosis on paper. You did it in your head. Here's this catch-all to help you describe you know, based on this time, uh, this is not uh, uh, clinically uh, evident, and there's no use of running it down even further. You can get a little better by talking about how the risks outweigh the benefits. Radiation and contract ri contrast risk that outweighs the potential uh, benefit. And then, even better, you start talking about shared decision-making. This was explained to the patient, and they agreed. And then, even better, in shared decision-making, like John talks about, getting into some data. You know, uh, or, or actually, at this time, the evidence for any other uh, entities and differentials is insufficient to warn against further testing or ED observation. This is that catch-all we talked about. At the end of it, this is the catch-all. This is explaining why it's reasonable you're not going further. Now, and we talked about this a bit. It kind of jumped the shark with a uh, question we had earlier. But what if, um, as opposed to the question which we addressed really in a sense of uh, the coders are after you to complete your documentation. You know there was a bad outcome, so what do you write? Well, be mindful of a risk that, you know, we talk about this, this very traditional legal concept of spoliation. Spoliation is when you know you might be liable for something. At least it can be shown kind of from the facts and evidence that maybe you could, you could tell you were going to be liable for something. But you destroyed evidence to prevent the person from ever getting their day in court. And the trick about spoliation is you don't have to prove the underlying malpractice case to prove spoliation. Um, th this was uh, evident in the latest troubles, you know, with the White House. It's not about um, covering up something that is illegal. It's about the cover-up itself that um, um, it, it is prob a problem um, for them and could be for you and could lead to liability if it looks like you were trying to cover something up, even if you weren't. So what do you do? Just be very objective. Just like Ross said, you know, take these uh, notes from your materials, take them to heart, and just be very objective as to why you are documenting late. And if you know the person came back in and, and had a bad outcome, you got to put it in there. Because if you don't, and you just you know, put in late documentation, and you don't say why, they're going to allege you were trying to do it to CYA. And it's going uh, to look, it's going to look unprofessional. We've talked a lot about APP supervision. That's something that's very important, a hot topic. Really, the, the success of how you collaborate with your APPs is going to go a long way to how you are successful in your practice over the next long term. But, you know, what do you do? What do you write? Um, what if, uh, you know, you're one of those sites where they make me sign all the APP charts? What do you do? Um, Again, like I said earlier in a question, there's not, a lot, there's not any magic bullet I've found that this is what you write, and then you're not going to have a problem. Um, it is important to be uh, objective, tell the truth, and not be the snarky teenager. You know, when you're writing some qualifying statement for why you're signing the APP's chart, I've heard a lot of different um, uh, suggested qualifying statements for signing the APP's chart. Uh, some things that come to mind are, you know, signing uh, per the administrative requirements of the hospital. Okay, that's true, um, but w w how does that help you? H how does that help, um, you know, your, your name is still on the chart, 
And now we can, we can argue uh, that that looks bad because as a plaintiff attorney, I'll say, so it was an administrative requirement of the hospital and you just did the bare minimum. Um, you know, it was obvious this patient had a tachycardia on discharge. Why didn't you do anything? You just did the bare minimum per the administrative requirement of the hospital. It doesn't help you at all, and it can be twisted against you. So what I advise, really, my kind of go-to is, you know, if they make you sign it, what, what are you going to do? You've got to sign it. Um, and, and anything you write is not going to change the fact um, that you signed it. Uh, one uh, qualifying statement I've seen that I do um, ag agree with is, this is from John, from John Badola. He just says, I was available for consultation. That's accurate. Um, it doesn't really, um, you know, create any uh, negativity uh, under your signature. So I think this is a, a good qualifying statement if you think you really need one. But then, you know, returning to what John has said before uh, and one of the earlier uh, lessons, you, you, when you sign it, understand your name's on the chart now. And yes, you could be um, uh, potentially held liable for what went into it. So quick review. You know, if you can, depending on your bandwidth, if you've got a little bit of time, just check the vital signs. You know, see if there was something on discharge that's really worrisome. Just a quick triage of the chart with the understanding that you put your, you're putting your name on the chart, so are you comfortable um, with that? And just take a quick review, if you can, just kind of based on your limitations and your time. Some, some more um, um, detail around this physician-APP relationship. So what if you get into a situation where you've got a nice collaborative shop, this is great, and you've got some quick consultations. Somebody just comes by and says, hey, we take a quick look at this x-ray, do you agree with what I'm thinking? Or, you know, what's the best antibiotic to use uh, in, this, in this patient? Well, it, it's something that's going to come out in discovery either way. So if you um, are reluctant to document because you think, if I don't document, nobody's ever going to know about it, well, that's not accurate. So if it's going to come out anyway that this collaboration happened, like John says, why not control the narrative? Why not put, put something in there that, per um, um, your perspective, accurately uh, describes the situation? Now, it's, it's not necessary all the time, every time, probably. Like, there's two scenarios I gave you of, you know, what's, what's the best antibiotic to use, or, you know, can you take a quick look at this x-ray? You know, maybe it's not really necessary to document a note there. Just a quick consultation, just a quick back and forth, almost like a hallway, just a bit of advice. You know, is it really necessary to document something in the chart? I don't think it hurts, but probably not necessary. But if it's a real um, involved consultation, um, a little bit more formal, a little bit open, uh, a more open-ended of just, you know, what do you think about this patient? I got a patient over here, and here's the vital signs, and, you know, what should I do? It's, it's probably best to document a note in those, in those situations. Um, and then in, in, in a situation where, you know, an APP consults with um, the physician and the APP is going to document a note, again, the physician, if, if you're involved in those kinds of consultations, it's probably best to go ahead and put something in the chart. Just add a little bit more color as to what was going on in the consultation. It's going to create a better, cleaner chart for me to defend. And then a twist on something we talked about earlier, what if you find... Yeah, a, a, a discrepancy between you and the nurses. No. What if you find a discrepancy discrepancy between you and the APP? Well, the same guidelines really hold. You know, be objective, but control your narrative now. Maybe what you see was not apparent earlier, or maybe straight up you just disagree. Well, you've got to address it. The discrepancy is the problem, and addressing it is how you fix the problem. So you've got to address it somehow. Be professional, be objective. Here's a great example. You know, they noted this. My subsequent evaluation, I'm noting this. You know, and, and like Ross says, at this time. Maybe things have changed, but they say this, but this is what is different now. And documenting it objectively like that is the way to go. We've talked about informed refusals, AMAs. You know, best, what's the best way um, to document that? that stuff if you run into those situations. Well, um, like we said, like we've said over and over again, an AMA form is fine. Um, it can be helpful, but it is not the end-all, be-all. 
we have to have good documentation as to why um, what you did was reasonable in the face of a patient who demanded to leave. First of all, like we said, did they have capacity? Address objectively why you felt this person had capacity to make this dangerous decision. You explain to them all that stuff, um, all the information to help them decide uh, for themselves to whether or not to take this, this dangerous step. And then, you know, Ross talked about this. You, you want them to come back. I hope you come back. Come back in a minute. And, and that, to me, describes um, a good uh, uh, way to approach the AMA conversation or the AMA interaction. It doesn't have to be a conflict. It doesn't have to be negative. They are making this decision you don't agree with, but it doesn't have to be a fight. And in fact, if it is a fight, you know, that really often, or that can lead to the situation where the patients just leave mad, and they tell everybody how mad they were, and then they drop dead, and the, pac and the patient's family is P.O.'d. But if you really approach it, um, you know, uh, with empathy and with as much understanding as you can and try to make it positive and say, hey, you know, I disagree. I know you're leaving. Here's some things we could do. And if you get worse, please come back. Please come back. That, that can create a positive situation that if they do get worse, man, I hope they do come back. Because in those situations where it's negative and they get worse, they're probably not going to come back because they don't like you anymore. Another good tip on shared decision making, you know, uh, we talked a lot about shared decision making. I think the, the, the behavior around shared decision making we've explained is when, when you've got situations that are kind of roughly equal, those are good cases for shared decision making. But, you know, how do you document it? Well, here you go. Here's a good tip in your materials on how to document it. It's all about, you know, you explain the risk benefits and alternatives, and I explained it in a shared decision making conversation. Use that term of art, shared decision-making conversation. If you use that, I'm going to see it later. I know what it means, and, and we, look, we look good. We look professional when we explain to the plaintiff's attorney what a shared decision-making conversation is. And, and, and here's how to expand on it. Here's how to make it even better. If you have one of those tools of, you know, PCARN, heart score, um, and, and, and they can derive the uh, uh, risk uh, the, the nu numeric risk to the patient, this is the way we like to see it illustrated. One out of X. Uh, one out of 100, one out of 1,000. One out of less than 100 probably is not a, a, a case that's appropriate for shared decision making. So yeah, one out of 100, one out of 500, one out of 1,000, 2,500. Those numbers really have a lot of value. And not only describing to the patient uh, why uh, um, you, are, you are comfortable with this shared decision, but then later on, laypersons understand. They understand this sort of uh, uh, illustration of relative risk and why it was reasonable for you and the patient to agree together to uh, take this, this step and this disposition. Something else that comes up from time to time is on-call physicians who don't respond at the drop of a hat. And I've seen some different uh, ways to document that this is a problem. Say you've got an on-call physician who you've, you know, paid. Maybe they still have a pager because they're late and they're kind of in the 20th century. But they're, they're not showing up. You're calling them. They're, they're not coming. So, so what, do you, what do you put in the chart? Well, this is the way I, I've seen it illustrated sometimes. And this can look like it, it's casting dispersions. Looks like it's throwing stones. Looks negative. And, and kind of illustrates, you know, we got a problem in the ER. And that puts blood in the water uh, for plaintiff's attorneys. This is even worse. And then a, a better way to illustrate it is like this. You know, again, just uh, uh, talk about the objective uh, facts that are happening right now. Called them, and at this time, has not called back. But um, w when you're in difficult situations like this, again, like I talked about when you don't have uh, some resources, you don't have a CT, you don't have overnight reads, stuff like that, it, it, it's not the end of the conversation that you don't have these resources. It, you, you then need to explain why what you did was still reasonable. So um, this is a, a, the, the best uh, expanded version of the documentation on, on, on explaining somebody's not coming in, and here's what you're going to do about it, and here's why. It's reasonable. Dirty words are words you should never use in the chart. And we've talked about some of them. 
Definitely number one is malingering. Um, I have seen it argued by a plaintiff attorney. So what did the patient gain by faking it? You think she just liked, you know, getting poked and prodded in the ER? Maybe, but that sounds pretty deranged now that we've got a, a debilitated uh, stroke patient, you know, for, for the rest of her life. Malingering, just don't write it. Um, and instead, describe it objectively. Maybe you think so. Maybe you really believe it. But you can describe it objectively as to what the person is doing, maybe when mom is or is not in the room, and when you are or are not in the room. All these other things, you know, just they imply judgment. Instead of doing the work to describe what you're seeing, you're just judging it and putting it in the chart. And the problem with that is that if you're wrong, you, you, you really look like a jerk. And, 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 and so what I've seen in a lot of cases is, you know, the folks who come in, the folks who you think are exaggerating or they're lying or they're drug seekers, they probably don't look like you. They probably are not, you know, professional, successful, middle-aged physicians and APPs. They are probably in a much different phase and, 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 and uh, uh, illustrated, their life is very different than yours. And so if you put this judgment in the chart and you turn out to be wrong, what they're going to do is they're going to spin this narrative of you just straight up discriminated, discriminated against this person because you didn't like them. And you know what? They probably weren't likable people. There might be these videos of these people just acting all crazy. But put stuff like this in the chart. They then make you look like a real villain. And when you do that, especially in an environment where the jurors look a lot like the patient, they all get very angry at you. And when jurors get angry, that's when they get a bit out of control. And the cases I know where we've paid, you know, six, seven, eight figures, that, that there's this narrative of the physician blew this patient off, they didn't care, they judged them, and they have words like this in the documentation to uh, illustrate um, what they're alleging. The better ways, like I've said, to illustrate this kind of behavior is just tell me objectively what you see and hopefully what they said, because sometimes it really makes me laugh. Here's a couple of examples from some of our cases. You know, using foul language, argumentative, refusing to stay in the room. That's great. Very objective. And he told me to, you know, kiss his ass. And security's at the bedside. I know exactly what's going on in that situation. Now, isn't that so much better than belligerent or uncooperative? I'll let you enjoy this one. This guy, man, he was serious. So he was definitely not playing. And I just, I, I, I really want to meet this guy. Okay, so the plan was, so you're going to leave the ER, you're going to go get on, uh, I don't know, uh, there's websites where you can get t-shirts made up. So you're going to invest a little bit in these t-shirts, but first you've got to get back on heroin, and you're going to get the t-shirts, you can give them to your kids, and be like, okay, guys, goodbye, but make sure you wear the t-shirts. Anyway, I think that's just funny. Yeah, but it's great. So, so you know, why do you, why do you write that? You know, I, I mean, arguably, you know, the, 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 the ER provider is being, um, maybe they're being judgy and putting that all in the chart, um, but that's certainly not how it played out uh, in the case. You know, this was uh, in, the, in the documentation, and we dealt with this in the case, and we were able to accurately portray this person's behavior. And it was understandable what our ER provider did in that difficult circumstance that was described here very well, rather than just talking about him being a drug seeker. And we're going to talk about a couple of case studies. These are my two favorite cases when it comes to documentation. And they illustrate a lot of other good points. So this, um, this case happened very recently. And you see here, um, you know, what's going on. She's got a history of kidney stones. You notice she's a, a febrile in the ER. That's important. You got your urinalysis suggested of infection. You got an ultrasound of the right kidney revealing the hydronephrosis. CT scan reveals a stone in the right uterus causing the hydronephrosis. And the hydrouterer patient's treating urologist was contacted but did not feel the findings were indicative of infection. Patient's discharged with Flomax, pain medication with a plan to follow up with her urologist. Patient returns two days later with sepsis due to an infected stone. 
And she succumbed to that infection, and we got sued on this case. Now, it came out in the case that the patient reported a fever. But, like I said, this patient was afebrile. She didn't report that, or we didn't know about that. Why? Well, we got into the chart, and first we printed it out. And we said, and, and, and we figured out why uh, the provider didn't know about it. And it looked like an unforgivable sin. Why didn't you know about the fever? But then we took it back and plugged it back into the EMR system and saw what the provider saw on the day in question. And this is what he saw. So this is like a, you know, the little box that shows uh, what the patient told the nurse. And I don't see anything about fever in there. But then if you look at it a little closer to see what's going on, in that little box, you see a clue there as to why there might be some more information. And it's that darn scroll bar. Now, I mean, I look at this, end of a paragraph, a nice space, that's the whole box. I'm moving on with my life. But if you scroll down, you see this. So, this was a fatal flaw, you know, in the documentation, and that led to uh, an unsuccessful defense of the case. Because the plaintiffs come along and they're critical of that failure to appreciate uh, the history of the fever, and you got to prescribe antibiotics. And really, and this is a case where, you know, if this was your case, um, you might feel uh, like the provider did and said, you know what, I didn't see it, and I, I wish I did because I would have acted differently, and I just can't defend myself uh, based on that. So we tried to defend this case based on proximate cause. Proximate cause is a type of, uh, of defense where you say, yeah, um, standard of care was not met, but this was going to happen either way. They're not really powerful defenses, and it's our last, um, uh, it's, it's the last strategy we ever try to employ. Because, I mean, if you think about it, it probably didn't work well in front of a jury. You say, yeah, we screwed up and they're dead, but they were going to die anyway. They're not very, they don't look very, um, uh, very well in those kinds of arguments. So, yeah, but we did work it up uh, as much as we could, and we resolved the case for about mid to low six figures. So, you know, I mean, what can you say? EMRs are, are tough. You had that gap there that was just impossible to see, so you didn't see the fever. And, you know, you get to know your EMRs. I, I'm hopeful that EMRs have, have progressed and continue to progress. I think there are some good ones out there. But, you know, EMRs uh, can sink you. So it's very important to be savvy to your EMR uh, uh, at your site. We will uh, have one more case, and then we're done. This is, this is my favorite case. It illustrates a lot of uh, what I preach, not just in a documentation sense, but in the, the real overarching themes of what I think is powerful in preventing cases against you and being successful in the cases against you. So here we go. So a 16-year-old female born with spina bifida, hydrocephaly, and had a VP shunt. She presented with her grandmother for a new onset headache that reportedly began at 3 a.m. that morning. She said this was the most severe, worst headache of your life. And you know that that's, that's important. So the first concern, we're thinking VP shunt malfunction. And the ER doc uh, immediately orders a CT head and began headache protocol medicines. After giving Toradol, fentanyl, Decadron, and Reglon, the patient had one episode of being lethargic and uh, clammy with a pulse of 47 and a BP of 137 over 67 and no irregular breathing. Now, upon being notified of this new condition, the, uh, the physician went to the patient's bedside and found her to be, to be resolved of the episode. She remained at her baseline, talking to folks, no distress, no lethargy, no vomiting, and no longer with a headache. So the ER doc reviews the CT, confers with the radiologist. Um, the scan shows the patient had enlarged ventricles consistent with known hydrocephalus, but no signs of increased intracranial pressure. The patient was clinically stable without lethargy, vomiting, or seizure. She had a normal neuro exam. She did have some lingering neck pain, but her headache was, was resolved. She's feeling much better. ER doc held her in the emergency department to confirm, you know, nothing's going on here, about three hours, and then the physician and the patient's grandmother felt comfortable sending her home. 
uh, unfortunately. She arrived via EMS a little over three hours after discharge. This time unresponsive, that same ER doc treats her this time, uh, is able to resuscitate her, repeat the CT scan, which now shows increased swelling in the brain. She's transferred and a shunt rev revision is emergently uh, performed. Over the next 25 days, though, the patient had multiple issues indicative of anoxic injury, and then she was allowed to expire. So the family, searching for uh, answers, filed a suit, and we retained experts. You know, we found a neuro expert that said it was impossible to know when that shunt malfunctioned or when the fracture occurred. And this expert said it's probably happened sometime after the first ED visit with a seizure. Uh, we had an EM expert said this patient did not present with classic findings for increased intracranial pressure or shunt blockage. Um, the CT didn't indicate acute, acute hydrocephalus. This plus the headache improvement, physical and neuro exam, palpation, and unchanged mental status made it reasonable to send her home with close follow-up instructions. But we did talk to a critical EM expert who said shunt was probably malfunctioning at the time and the ICP was increasing and you should have ruled it out definitively. Palpation was not enough to assess whether it was working. You needed to compare the CT to prior CTs and um, you should have acted when her heart rate fell and her mental status changed. And then on the documentation uh, point, uh, the expert pointed out a problem in the documentation. So this was just straight up an error. Wasn't true, conflicted with the real story, and it was uh, an embarrassment. This was auto-populated in the EMR, and the physician failed to remove it. So we had to explain this error. Again, not a fatal error, oftentimes, as documentation errors are, but um, you know, a nagging issue on the defensibility of the case. So then we move along in the case to the depositions. And we talked to the physician, or the patient's grandmother, who was there. And she described uh, the ER physician as a nice man. Um, and, you know, said they exchanged uh, phone numbers after the bad outcome. Um, the ER physician remembered some exchanges he had with the patient, where she said, everybody loves me. And he was kind of joking with her and was like, well, I can totally see why. So, um, you know, this, this uh, uh, um, deposition testimony gave us an idea. So it gave us a plan to uh, dispose of this case. Now, I talked a little bit about tort reform states. You know, laws vary widely from state to state. But a place like Texas, where this happened, or in Georgia and some other states, you know, there's a heightened standard for ER uh, liability. Um, gross negligence, willful and wanton, all that kind of stuff. So it, with, with this testimony um, showing the uh, benevolent uh, behavior of the ER provider, um, plus all the stuff he did, all the stuff he did to try to figure out what was going on with this patient. Maybe he could have done more. Yeah, maybe under you know, a typical standard of care, he could have done more to try to figure out what was going on here. But given the stuff he did do, and given this testimony um, a a as to uh, uh, his, his behavior and his nature at the ER, there's no way we get tagged for conscious, reckless, willful indifference. It just doesn't match up. So we, gave, we had an idea, and we filed a motion for summary judgment. Now, very rarely cases are disposed of with motions for summary, summary judgment. Motion for summary judgment is you just kind of take all the facts as they are known at that time. You take them in the, fa the facts in the light most favorable to the plaintiff, and you argue to the judge, even with the facts as they are most favorable to the plaintiff, as a point of law, there is no reasonable juror who can find against us. So you prepare all that, and then, like I said, they don't often uh, grant them. Um, uh, like I talked about in the Imtala course uh, uh, lesson, uh, state court judges don't like to rock the boat too much. They don't like to dispose of cases. They like the juries to do that, because if they do it, there's kind of a responsibility on them, and they want to get reelected. They want to get along. So motions for summary judgment don't often get, get granted. But what you can do is you can hedge your bets. So you put, the, you put your, your opponent on the ropes. You got him on the ropes with a motion for summary judgment. You got this deposition testimony. You got the good standard <coughs> in favor of your, of your provider. So what you do, get them on the ropes and then offer to settle. And that's what we did. So we put out that motion for summary judgment. 
and we offered to settle for costs. A settlement for costs has a lot of advantages. I talked to you about National Practitioner Data Bank reports. There's, there's very few exceptions to a National Practitioner Data Bank report when there is a settlement for you. But a settlement for costs is one of them. If you do it right, um, and, and that is you, you say to the plaintiff, okay, give us all your receipts, uh, expert fees, filing fees, travel, copying, stuff like that, and we'll, we'll pay it all. And usually it's like, you know, $10,000, maybe twenty, And we'll pay it all, and you just, you go away. We go our separate ways, we just pay your costs, and it's over. That is not reportable to the data bank. So um, it, it, it's often the preferred method for the, um, the least liable defendants to try to get out of a case. You see everybody kind of jockeying for that uh, in mediation. But that's what we offered. And amazingly... You know, they said yes. And they said yes if you put out a CME on VP shunts. We know y'all do uh, medical education. We want a CME on VP shunts. We want a uh, meeting with the ER physician without any lawyers present. And we want reimbursement for a bench so we can visit her grave and, and sit on a nice bench. And we took it, um, and we did all this stuff. We put out the CME, we gave them the money for the bench, and we uh, had that private meeting. And, and the physician came out of it saying, I, I feel so much better after having that meeting. And really, everybody at the end of that meeting said, we wish we just could have done this at the beginning. Um, and just, you know, had a small payment, had a nice meeting and answered our questions, and we wouldn't have had to go through all that hell for the past two years. Um, so that's a great... Uh, uh, argument for early claims resolution. But this resolution of this case uh, gives me an opportunity to end the case and the whole seminar with the two points I want to leave you with from this whole seminar. And that is, if, if you're compassionate, if you just do what's right for the patients, if you, if you, you know, express compassion uh, and diligence with your patients, you know, not only are your patients much less, li less, less likely to sue you, because they're less likely to get angry to think that you wrong them and they're willing to go through the trouble of a malpractice case, but you will also have better outcomes in litigation if you are a diligent, compassionate physician like this physician was. Because it really, it, it, it shines through the documentation. It, sign, it shines through the deposition testimony. If you just do the right thing, treat your patients right, express compassion, be the provider you know you can be, and that really will help you in the defense of any malpractice litigation. It means a lot more than you think. And then the final point, um, you know, all of these points we've talked about, you know, are difficult. They're complicated. You know, what do you do in this Imtala situation or, or this refusal situation, AMA situation, drunk patients, belligerent patients? You know, what do you do? Um, and it's hard to really navigate all these rules, um, all these pitfalls we've talked about. But you know, as we've repeated over and over again, if you just kind of backstop to what's right for the patient, what's the right thing for this patient, then that's 99% of the solution most of the time. All the things we talked about this week, you know, and taller this and taller that, um, all these little complicated rules, and then like, what should you do? Well, what should you do? Do what's right for the patient. Keep that forefront in your mind. And then you're much less likely to get sued, and if you do, that's going to shine through all the evidence, and you're going to have a better result. Anybody have any questions? We got one here. What you got? Um, what's your opinion on things like degenerative? Right. Yeah. So the question is, you use voice recognition software, very common these days, and it really varies in how well it understands you and types it into the chart. I've seen good and bad. Uh, I mean, there, there is the, the issue of the nagging on the case. Um, again, it's not fatal. It makes you look sloppy. It makes you look unprofessional. It's not dissimilar to when charts were handwritten and I couldn't read your writing and it looked like it was in crayon. You know, it, it, didn't, it didn't destroy the case, but it, it, they, they definitely exploited that. They would blow it up and, say, and, and they would have the physician try to read their own writing and make them look foolish. Um, and, and, and that's the same for uh, voice recognition software. It's quite possible they blow up the chart while you're on the witness stand and they have you read it. And you know, you feel silly and you look silly. 
Um, it's not a fatal problem. Um, I, I, you know, if, if you have better software, get it. Um, if, if your software stinks, um, try to get better software. But, um, you know, if you know you have some typos here or there, it's not really necessary to double check it every time. Um, that's not going to add a lot of value. The real risk I'm worried about is the fatal error created because of some just total miscommunication in the voice recognition software. Instead of no, it just doesn't put the word in there at all. Things that can just completely change the uh, accuracy of the documentation. I've seen it once, um, and it was because of voice recognition software. So that's the real risk there, is the worse the software, the more likelihood that rare circumstance is going to happen. So be mindful of that real fatal risk. And then, yeah, you probably don't have to worry so much about maybe it doesn't look great, as long as it doesn't look terrible. Any other questions before we adjourn? All right, well, thank you all for your attention. It's a privilege to be here. I'm glad you all came, and we'll be hanging around if you have any other questions. <laughs>